Mara Brockakill, you mean the world to me. And let me explain why. To understand me, you have to understand that I was that five-year-old who begged her mother to see Wait to Excel in the movie theater. And even at that young age, like I craved to see Black women on the big screen. I craved to see that sisterhood, that friendship, that solidarity. I knew nothing about this at five, but I knew it was something that I was drawn and attracted to. And so growing up, and coming of age in the early 2000s, um, you know, that was the age where there was very limited representation of Black women on television and in movies. And so what I was socialized to believe was the ideal were the video models, the video vixens that were, you know, they were considered to be sexy and beautiful and exotic and cool and the ideal. And what was problematic about that was that they were also very over-sexualized. So I saw that in order to be considered beautiful or to be validated by men, you have to be half naked, you have to be shaking your booty, you have to be, you know, that was ideal. That's what validation and beauty looked like to me growing up until girlfriends hit the scene. And I finally saw myself, I saw my future self, you know, I saw I was craving for this. And I saw a representation of what black womenhood is, what it could look like, its flaws, its multifacetedness, its dimension. I saw my future self in Joan Clayton. And I think I was like 11 or 12 at the screen watching UPN 9 like this. Every freaking week until the last episode when I was in college. I grew up with Joan, Maya, Tony, and Lynn. Um, and when I looked at Joan, I saw my future self. You know, she had the natural hair and she had the beautiful figure and she had beautiful clothes. She was ambitious. She was smart. She had goals. She had dreams. She was a hopeless romantic. She wanted love. She wanted to live her best life. She just showed me who I could become and who I could be. And until then, I didn't see that. And even in the other women, Lynn, with her multiple degrees, Maya, who ended up writing a book, Tony, who, you know, just was the super ambitious real estate agent, she, they showed me, all four of these women showed me the possibilities of who I could become. And it was the first time, the very first time since Waited to Excel that I saw myself and I saw what I wanted. I saw the uh, friendship that could be considered family. I saw the degrees that Lynn had, you know, that I should be getting degrees, um, that I should be, you know, Joan, she was a homeowner. Maya, she was a single mother, but she wrote books. She became something. She went to school. She grind. So like for me, those characters were out of your brain. They were out of your mind. You created, you know, these representatives for black womanhood. And it was something that at that time in the 2000s, we were yearning for. And you were that pillar for us. Thank you for that, first of all. I thank you for putting what was in your spirit out there because you changed my life. You changed my life. And so I will continue to say that I went off to college and I wanted to be a lawyer initially. And, um, but then I decided, no, that's not really what I want to do. I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to follow my heart and I want to figure out what it is that I want to do. And that was also, just to go back to girlfriends, something that I saw for the first time ever that also changed my life was Joan pivoting, doing a career pivot from being a lawyer. I thought at that time, I was young, that when you had a career, you were set on that career forever and that was it, you couldn't change. But seeing Joan be a successful lawyer 
and then decide she didn't want to do it anymore. She wanted to follow her dreams and start a business and open up a restaurant. I was like, whoa, I didn't know that was possible. And so in my own career, when I'm torn between doing what my family says, which is becoming a lawyer or figuring out life in my career for myself, I made that same pivot. So when I graduated from college, I wanted to, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I had student loan debt. And so I became an assistant at a financial technology company. And after four years of being at this place, I felt very unfulfilled. I felt like I was not following my spirit. I was not following my purpose. I was not following my passions. And so I went on this journey to start searching for what it is that I want to do. And my best friend invited me to the American Black Film Festival in 2015. And I, it was my first time ever coming into contact with you, this woman that I grew up just admiring. And I watched you on this panel, I believe it was called The Day in the Life of a Showrunner. I just watched you. And I, this was the first time I had ever heard your stories. So I had grown up watching your stories, but I had never heard your own personal story. And so at this time, you have to understand, I am an assistant. I don't want to be an assistant anymore. I want to leave my current job. I don't know what my career is going to be. Like, I don't know what I want to do. And I heard you tell your story. And you talked about being an assistant, starting out as an assistant. And you revealed how you got your girlfriends um, up and running. I believe you put the script on your boss's desk and you just shared with full transparency, full, like just your authenticity. Everything about you was everything I believed you would be. And just your transparency who you are, how you showed up in that session. I was more enamored and in love with you <laughs> than ever before. But the fact that you said you started out as an assistant and as you just shared your story, Mara, it changed my life, okay? And let me tell you how. I left that session, during that session and during ABFF, everyone was talking about spec script, pilot script, and you had mentioned you wrote a pilot script as well. And I left not knowing what the heck these things were. What is a pilot script? What is a spec script? You know, I heard it during your session. I heard you talk about it. There were so many things I didn't know. And I left first. My first thing was I was going to humble myself. Because Mara said she started out as an assistant, I was also going to humble myself and be okay with being an assistant. My second thing, just by hearing that panel, I knew I was going to pivot, just like Joan, into a new industry. And that industry was going to be TV media, media, TV production, whatever. That was going to be my industry now. That was what I needed to do. I needed to break into media fast. The third thing that I left with wanting to do from that panel was figuring out what a spec script was, what a pilot script is, and how I was going to write one. <laughs> I was so inspired by your story and your words and your transparency. And um, guess what? I did all three. I humbled myself. I, for the next year and a half, I wasn't going to complain about being an assistant because Mara was an assistant too. She also started out somewhere too. And I humbled myself. I spent the next year and a half applying to jobs in media, applying to jobs just to break in. And I never complained about being an assistant. I knew my time was temporary and I just applied. I knew I wanted to break into media. I actually broke in. I A year and a half later, I 
did um, start out again as an assistant to just break in, but I worked my way up two years later. I was promoted to a management and um, I work in the diversity department. The third thing that happened was immediately, I think a couple of months later, well, that day I Googled what a spec script was and a pilot script was. A couple of months later, I saved up enough money to go to a TV writing class and I took two, three TV writing classes. I wrote my first spec script and my spec script was on being Mary Jane. And then I wrote, um, I've been writing, you know, I've been writing stuff, TV scripts and stuff. So you, your words, who you are, what you mean to me, you don't know me from a hole in a wall, but you have changed my life. Whenever someone asks those questions like, who would you have if you could pick anyone dead or alive that you would have a dinner party with, who would it be? You're always number one on my list. You are always number one because I am so enamored by you. I'm enamored by your mind. Oh, and one more thing. So Love Is. When Love Is came out, it was after some episode, I can't remember. And I basically wrote, you know, I was so inspired by the show. It was so beautiful and authentic. And it was one of the most beautiful shows that was on television. It was just beautiful. I don't even have another word to describe it. Well done. Beautiful. Um, when Love Is came out, I remember after an episode, I wrote Love Is in my journal and I listed all the things that I thought love is. And I didn't know at the time I was manifesting love. I was manifesting the type of love I wanted in my life. And so a year after that, or maybe a few months probably a few months after that, I met someone who had, if I had like 20 things on the list, they had 18 of the 20 things that I listed. And it's my boyfriend now. So you are, <laughs> your authenticity, your transparency, your beautiful mind, your spirit, it shows. Like I've never met you, but I know that you are someone that I would uh, you're like my best friend in my head. You really are. You are everything to me. And I wish you the happiest of 50th birthdays. You deserve it. I hope one day I'm putting it out there that I can meet you just to tell you in person how much you've meant to me. But you are goals, Mara. And I hope you know that. So happy birthday.